Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, and welcome to the Don P. Giddens inaugural professorial lecture. Uh, it's truly my pleasure to be here uh, with you all to uh, honor Professor Eileen Haas, a teaching professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and the chair of the Applied Biomedical Engineering graduate program. Eileen has been tremendously successful in these roles, and not only has she grown enrollments through online courses and on-campus laboratory and clinical experiences, she has threatened, threatened, she has, <laughs> she has strengthened <laughs> BME undergraduate education. Right. So Freud, maybe I was right the first time, yeah. Uh, and served as the principal investigator for the Johns Hopkins University Gateway Sciences Initiative Provost Award for developing the BME Design Studio. So let me pause here for a moment and deviate a little bit from the prepared remarks. Eileen is giving her inaugural professorial lecture. She is a now a full teaching professor in biomedical engineering and in the Whiting School. To my knowledge, she is our very first teaching, full teaching professor in the Whiting School of Engineering. Not, not only is this appropriate because of her accomplishment, as I will share with you, but it certainly sets the bar for teaching professors in the Whiting School of Engineering, as you'll see. She is an award-winning educator known for incorporating team-based learning and other active learning methods in her classes. In 2018, she served as a Fulbright Scholar and visiting professor at Mabarara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. She continues to challenge pairs of Ugandan and JHU students to develop global health solutions. You'll hear more about her work there today. She is the two-time recipient of the Whiting School of Engineering's Robert B. Pond Senior Excellence in Teaching Award. She's received multiple William R. Kennan Jr. Awards for improving teaching in an undergraduate course. She's a member of the JHU Teaching Academy, a Teaching Academy Board, where she mentors PhD students interested in teaching, and all of that really doesn't uh, fully capture all that she does in the educational enterprise, both in BME and, and in Whiting. Um, she's truly an amazing, amazing asset uh, to our programs and a leader in our programs, and, and so it is particularly noteworthy and appropriate that we are honoring her in this way today. Uh, before we do that, I would like to take a moment to recognize one of my predecessors, Don Giddens, for whom the inaugural professorial lecture series is named. Don Giddens was the fifth Dean of Engineering at Johns Hopkins and a professor of Mechanical Engineering. And like Eileen Haas, his career has been defined by a commitment to both research and education. And with that, so first of all, congratulations Eileen. And with that, I'd like to introduce Warren Grayson, Professor and Vice Chair for Faculty Affairs in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Warren. Good afternoon. So I have to say it's really one of the nice things about uh, experiences like this is you get to learn about how actually awe-inspiring and motivational it is to be colleagues with people like Eileen. So I've known Eileen, of course, and cannot come here as someone who's been involved in all the ABET accreditation is most of the time I'll hear from her. But my main, or my first main interaction, I guess, I had with her was when she asked me to teach the systems physiology lab, a module there. And it was about eight or nine years ago, but I remember how she asked me. So that's why it, it stood out to me, because she didn't say, well, you know, we need someone to teach this class, or would you like to fill in this space? She said, Warren, the students would love to hear from you. You know, and I thought I was really surprised. I didn't know the students even knew who I was. <laughs> and of course, they didn't know who I was, right? It's just Eileen's way. It's actually, it turns out to be much more convincing to say the students would like to hear from you than to say, I would like you to teach this class. Uh, and it, it was a great experience from that time on. Um, in trying to prepare some remarks for today, I, asked, I actually reached out to some colleagues of Eileen, people who have known her for, for a long period of time, who've worked with her, and people who've interacted with her in a different sphere than I have. And one of the people I reached out to, and I'm gonna read some comments here, so that's why I'm pulling up my phone. One of the people I reached out to was Kathy Janko, who's worked with Eileen for a really long period of time. 
And uh, Kathy responded immediately, but I thought I really had to read what she said because it was so, this is the first thing that I thought was so inspiring. So this is uh, Kathy's comments. Eileen embodies all of the qualities of what every human should strive for. She constantly works to improve the learning environment of her students, supports every faculty member, and is always seeking ways to use biomedical engineering to solve world problems, like access to medical care in developing countries. <coughs> Excuse me. Personally, Eileen is also the kindest, most caring, and dedicated faculty member I have ever worked with, since she's always focused on positive outcomes. There was more, I, I didn't add all of it uh, for the sake of brevity, but the other thing that she said was that back in early 2019, Eileen, apparently this is something that happened that you may or may not have been aware of. There was an effort to put together a booklet of accolades for Eileen. And so Kathy's job in that was to actually get some comments from students that Eileen had worked with. And she sent me a, a long list of comments and I've taken just two of them. They all pretty much have the same sentiment in all of them. So I'll read just two of them. And the first one is, the, is directed at you, Eileen. So it says, thank you so much for all you do for JHU BME. It is so easy to see not only your passion for the material you teach, but your dedication to each individual student with whom you work. From taking the time to respond to emails, to meeting with students one-on-one, -on -one, to your involvement in so many areas of the BME program. You're a fundamental part of every biomedical engineering undergraduate experience. I am so grateful for all you have done for me during my four years here, and I cannot imagine my time here without you as an instructor and a mentor. Many of the other uh, uh, responses are very similar, <coughs> but just one more that I'll read. Who do you see as your role model? I have been asked this question many times since coming to Hopkins. My answer has been Dr. Haas. Dr. Haas has shown us that he can do it all. Be a professor, mother, interim director, Fulbrighter, apparently this is a word now, Fulbrighter, mentor, supervisor, advisor, you name it. She is righteous, thorough, and kind in all that she does bringing the BME department to its fullest potential in the best way. She uplifts students and those who may not have had the chance to lead and deserves all the recognition for her investment in students. So uh, Eileen has been wonderful being your colleague um, and hearing all of these things that are said about you. And uh, I want to turn it over now to Professor Art Shukas, who has been Eileen's mentor. He's been one of the first five faculty members within BME, so he has a good sense of the history of the department and has known Eileen for so, uh, quite a period of time. So congrats again, Eileen, and welcome, Dr. Shukas. Knowing Eileen as well as I do, her heart rate is probably 95, <laughs> blood pressure over 140, <laughs> and sitting there trying to act calm <laughs> because she doesn't know what I'm going to say. But the years from 1989 to approximately 1997 in my laboratory were called the diaper years <laughs> because my first female graduate student was Martha Brunner. She had three children. They have two children each. I'm a grandfather for two of them, and I'm a grandfather for at least one of your children. So you know your age just by the fact that you look at your grandchildren and they're my academic grandchildren in actuality. I just wanted to say one thing about the department. When the department was originally started, we were looking for great researchers. The engineering school was not involved, actually, in the hiring of any of the faculty. They were all in the School of Medicine. 
and we were looking for great teachers. Those were the two criteria that we used when we hired faculty. Currently, and I've talked to Dr. Schramm about it, what is the, one of the other hallmarks of the department? It's actually that the faculty like each other. They don't fight with each other to try and help one another. And it's a camaraderie that has existed for the past 50 years. And I am hoping that that continues even with the size of the department as it is now. We started with five. My understanding is you have 50 now. It's hard to be a family with 50 and know your colleagues. Try to do it. It's the best thing that ever happens. If you have students, get to know them. I know all of my students. Once a year, I usually call at Christmas time and say, hi, I'm still alive. <laughs> and it really is rewarding to not only yourself, but to see their success, because their success is your success. I see people in this room I've known, I've stolen some of them from the School of Engineering, Kathy, to be one of the administrators for the undergraduate program. In all the years that I have been at Hopkins, I think the really prevalent thing that I see is the faculty care. They care about the students. And that is one of the most important things in life. Eileen, you're up next. Thank you for an incredible introduction, uh, Dean Ed, Warren, Art. Um, wow, <laughs> just really left me touched. Um, just honored to be here and, and to have all of you here, um, people I've known for years. Uh, it just it's so touched by all of this. Uh, my entire career has been at Johns Hopkins. I started, let me see where I have this right, um, at the Applied Physics Laboratory in the Fleet Systems Department many, many years ago, um, right after college, and met some wonderful people there, including my husband of 35 years. Um, I got my master's through what's now the EP program in electrical engineering. I still am involved with EP and also the Applied Physics Lab. I had a meeting there just last week, as, as Ed knows, I was there with him too. Um, so it's just been a, a part of my life and something I am so proud of. So proud of for all these years. Um, when I started my PhD in biomedical engineering, at that time, I'm going to pull out here a little. Um, at that time, we had to go through the first year of medical school, all the PhD students. I, I'm causing some kind of ringing. Um, so one of the first people I got to know, of course, was um, Art Schuchitz. He did all the cardiovascular lectures. I loved working in lab um, as a cardiovascular systems physiologist. But what really inspired me was his teaching. Art was one of the originals when it came to active learning. He never just you know, gave a bunch of PowerPoint slides. He stopped, he talked to the students, he interacted, and he had all these cool props he would bring to class, such as the plastic dog. You know? Some people are laughing about this. This was a physical model of the cardiovascular system of a dog. It was pumps and tubes and that one long tube there measured arterial pressure. And you could hemorrhage this dog and get realistic numbers. And Art would occasionally increase the arterial pressure to make a really high blood pressure situation. And the water would shoot out the top and everybody in what was known as the splash zone, the first row there, would get wet. But the thing about Art's lectures is you remembered a few key points really well because they, they were just so interactive. You know, I see Shell nodding her head. Yes, you, you remember those lectures, right? Um, and another person who just really inspired me with teaching was Larry Schramm. Um, I worked in his lab too on, with the autonomic nervous system as a postdoctoral fellow. 
but Larry came to me and said, let's put together a class for the first year engineering students with no lectures. You know, and we're just gonna have them sit in teams and they'll have an upperclassmen and we'll have some equipment for them and they'll come up with equations to model the cardiovascular system and how to throw a ball, but there won't be any lectures. They're just gonna learn by doing and we'll just keep working with them on that. And we actually still teach this course. We have a couple different topics um, all those years later because it is such a great introduction to bottom engineering for our students. You just drop them in, you give them an impossible problem and say, hey, do your best. You know, make some assumptions and try, and we're here to guide you and help you and, and give it a shot. And both Art and Larry uh, just were so inspiring to me because they were way before any of the literature on active learning and stopping and doing, working in teams. They just knew this was the best way for students to learn. So that's how I learned how to teach. You know, you, you just give students interesting problems and you have them work together and you make it kind of a lot of low pressure situations and then they have fun and they're engaged and they really get to learn a couple of really key points. And I would be remiss if I did not mention another great person from biomedical engineering and this was Murray Sachs, who was one of the department chairs. Murray hired me as a teaching faculty when there was no teaching faculty in biomedical engineering. I don't even know if there were any teaching faculty within the Whiting School of Engineering at that there time. Were none in the medical school. There were none in the medical school. So Murray was a visionary. He had this idea that, hey, let's hire people whose job is to help make our undergraduate program better. This is their full-time job, and they help other faculty make the other program, the undergraduate program better. And I have just had these incredible mentors throughout my career who have really supported my decision to have a teaching career and I thank all of you who are here today and you know of course Mary has since passed but just I, I've had incredible people to work with. So teaching in Uganda which is the topic of my talk today I um, went there as a Fulbright scholar and you can call them a Fulbrighter yeah <laughs> they, they, they hold us those uh, and there's actually 8,000 Fulbrighters per year uh, about two-thirds of these are foreigners who come to the United States, uh, students, and also scholars, which would be people like me, a little more advanced in their career. And then, of course, one third <coughs> a U.S. citizen, again, a, a break between students. I guess Hopkins has about two dozen scholar, uh, students each year that go abroad and scholars. And out of the, let's say, 2,800 U.S. citizens who went abroad the year I went to sub-Saharan Africa, less than 6% we're going to, you know, those countries that are shown there in orange. So not a lot of people are shooting off to sub-Saharan Africa, and there were only 12 of us in STEM. So my proposal when I went to um, Africa was basically to accomplish three things. One, I wanted to teach. I wanted to teach in, in Embraer University of Science and Technology, and I taught two courses while I was there. I taught a biochemistry course to the first year students, and I taught a course on physiological modeling to what were the third year students, juniors. I also wanted to work with the MUS faculty on curriculum development for their new BME program. And I knew those third year students were the very first class. So when I taught the modeling physiological systems, there was a one sentence description. There was no syllabus, there were no course materials. I just put together you know, what I thought would be a good course for them. And the same with the biochemistry, the person who had taught it the year before left nothing. So I kind of made it up as I went there. Um, so this, these are my, my, oh, the third goal was a study abroad course to bring our Hopkins students to Uganda. So those are the three things in my proposal and that's what I'd like to talk to you all about today. I left on a snowy January in uh, 2019 and 24 hours later I was basically at the equator in Uganda. And Uganda has some beautiful, beautiful countryside. Uh, Winston Churchill described it as the Pearl of Africa. I saw some things in Uganda I'd never seen before. The um, mountains and lakes are just stunning. There's snow-covered mountains, there's thousands of lakes, there's tropical rainforests. Uh, Lake Victoria, which is the source of the Nile, is, is in Uganda, and just stunning, stunning scenery. There are beautiful birds. These Ugandan cranes make for life, and I see them all the time. They were just awesome to watch. Uh, the zebra, I went running with a few of the students in a national park and had a herd of zebra pass in front of us, and I told them, remember this. You will never be running with zebras again. No? And elephants and lions and, and all kinds of animals were there on Queen Elizabeth Park, 
aptly named for Queen Elizabeth, um, had pretty much every animal you can ever imagine, and the mountain gorillas. Um, pretty much the only place in the world you can see them is this intersection of Uganda and Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. There's only a couple hundred, and they were just so majestic. Seeing these families interacting was just, just so, so beautiful. Um, so, and the biodiversity in Uganda was just amazing. I had the best fruits and vegetables of my life, avocados that were just massive, and passion fruit, and mango, all these fields are hand-tilled fields. I never saw a tractor or any kind of electronic equipment on a field. And uh, just some of the, the freshest, most incredible foods I'd ever tasted. But despite all this abundance, life is hard. And uh, one of the things are the environmental issues. And a lot of this came up after Winston Churchill was there. Um, half the population does not have access to clean, safe drinking water. I, in theory, did, and this was the water in my apartment on occasion, you know. Um, there's garbage everywhere. There's no garbage pickup. And most of it's plastic, plastic bottles, plastic bags, and people burn this. And when I would go running in the morning, there'd be these puffs of smoke with this white toxic fumes from burning plastic. The smell, it would burn your eyes. Um, this was right near my apartment. It was very sad to see. And of course, you don't want anything to do with the goats that are eating this. The traffic is about the deadliest in the world. There's really no regulations on you know, car safety. There's no emission control. Um, the roads are bad, so people are basically driving like this. There's a ton of pedestrian accidents with this. And uh, most people actually get around on motorcycles, which are called boda bodas. I will never get used to seeing children on a motorcycle, and certainly not a mother holding an infant. And that's something we had to, yeah, I had to watch every day. Um, it was terrifying. About half the traffic accidents in Uganda are due to these motorcycles, which have absolutely no regulation. You don't even need a license to drive one of these. The government has a lot of issues. This was a view outside my office at the university one day. There were armed guards for a student government body election, which I didn't think would be a big deal. Um, but there's so much corruption within the government, and it's seeped down into the university that it turned out this actually was a big deal. And of course, the reason there's so much corruption is because President Museveni has been in office since 1986. He got rid of term limits. Uh, he took over in a military coup, and at first people were happy because he was after Idi Amin, who was a horrible dictator and slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Ugandans. But at this point, between the corruption the human rights violations. I mean, just this week I read about Uganda shutting off internet. And I think the thing that's bothering people the most is how we've handled education. The educational system um, is really failing there. Two thirds of students drop out by seventh grade. When you walk around the middle of the day, you see lots of children like this who really should be in school. And it's sad that they're not. Only 40% are literate by sixth grade. So the school system, after six years, a lot of them can't even read. 24% are sexually abused in school. The teachers are overworked. There's over 60 students in a lot of the classes, especially the primary grades. They're often absent. They don't get paid regularly. 40% do not have an undergraduate degree. And the result of all this is that the teachers rely on really rote memorization. They just tell the students what to memorize. There aren't enough books to share. The students can't even see the books to read. As you could tell from, hopefully this will work, this video. Nope, it didn't work. Why didn't the video work? <laughs> well, it did work in the past. Um, what happened, if what you could he hear, see here would be this, the students trying to read. And, and it's, you can see three of them, four of them are, oops, let me go backwards, are um, sharing a book together. They were closed for almost two years with COVID. There was no Zoom learning. <laughs> there was nothing just closed for two years. They just opened again in January. And of course, this created a kind of triage because all these new students came in and the old students hadn't learned a thing. So they just promoted them to make the classrooms not have 120 students instead of the 60. So all those numbers I showed you are gonna get worse, you know? Um, so in higher education, of course, things aren't getting better. Only one in four students even got to high school. And for those who work really hard and study hard and try to go on 
to get to the university, there's just not enough seats. Only 20% can even get into the university after they've gone through all of that and qualified. The cost is absolutely prohibited for poor people. The university I taught at costs about $700 a year, which I know is trivial compared to Johns Hopkins, but that was more than a lot of people made in a year. And there's no financial aid also. And then the strikes and protests, which by students, faculty, and staff, uh, the university I was at went on strike twice in the six months I was there. These strikes just happen all the time. As a result, um, the World Bank's Human Capital Index has said that a child born in Uganda today is likely to be 38% as productive when she grows up as she could be if she enjoyed complete <coughs> education and full health. That's a horrifying statistic. What a loss of human potential, not just to Uganda, but to the entire world, that um, these beautiful children, they, they heard there was a white woman in the school and came to the window, and look at them, they're just the beautiful children are not gonna reach their potential, you know? So I traveled from Kampala to Embarera with this background knowledge, it's all available online. It's about 160 miles, the first time we did it, it took seven hours because of all that traffic. And once in Embarera, it, Looks like this. This was the market I went to to get all those great fruits and vegetables. Went there at least twice a week. Um, this was towards the center of town. And near the center of town, they had both the hospital and the medical school. And then the engineering school was about four miles away. So I told my students, you're set up a lot like Johns Hopkins. You know, you have the medical school in one place and then the engineering school in another. Um, this was literally in the middle of a farmyard. You could hear cows while we were teaching. It was a relatively new building, and um, you know I, I couldn't complain about any of that, and I knew my students had beaten the odds to get there. I mean, they were smart, they were hardworking, they had really you know, gone against the grain to get to this spot, to get a position here. And I had my, you know, my Hopkins teaching tools, and I was just going to use those with them, but it turned out there were actually a number of other challenges with teaching in Uganda. First was the language. The official language is English, which is part of the reason I went there. But that's not their first language. There's over 40 official languages in Uganda. There's a lot of different tribes, and they teach children to read in their local language, which is the way to get them to read, which is a good idea, but it was difficult for a lot of these students to speak English. Some of them hadn't even started to really speak English in school until they got to college. Their high school might have not even used English. So we could quibble about whether I was the one with the accent or they were the one with the accent. <laughs> Um, but we had a hard time understanding each other. And um, it, it was pretty obvious from day one that when I talked, they just stood there with a blank face. It was as though I was talking in, the, in a foreign language. High school background, of course, was completely different. The, these students actually had a lot of math and physics, but pretty much no biology. Um, so none of them really knew the parts of a cell or anything like that. And of course, my Hopkins students come in Three quarters of them have had AP bio, you know, basically a college level biology. So there was a, very much a difference in what they came in with knowledge wise. Uh, the grading was set by the Minister of Education for the entire country, and 60% was the final exam. 30% was the midterm um, for me. Most classes were 40%, but I begged them, please, can I have something other than a midterm and a final? This is just goes against everything I believe as a teacher. So they let me have 10% of in class. Um, quizzes. I, I couldn't have any homework or anything that was graded. I know I, I see some students who are like, oh my gosh, that's, that's just horrible. But it puts a lot of pressure on that exam when that's the only thing you're getting graded on. And their schedule. Uh, we met once a week for three hours straight. That's a lot of biochemistry at one time, or a lot of modeling and physiological systems. And these students were taking nine classes, 27 credits. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they had these three hour classes. Friday was the only day that they only had class in the morning. That's just quite a schedule. So they were working really hard, hard course load, and there were just a lot of things that made teaching quite difficult. So my solution to all of this was cooperative learning and peer instruction. I put them in teams on day one, and they stayed in teams the entire semester, and that was the only way we got anything accomplished. And of course, I'd learned that from Art and Larry, put students in teams. That's how you'll, you'll get them to learn. Um, and so I did lots of collaborative learning activities. These are things I do with all my Hopkins students, too. So there's nothing new, really, there. 
Um, one is like think, pair, share. I would show a problem on how enzymes work and then give them a problem on how enzymes work and then they would work together to see if they could do it. And then I would have a team come up that I knew had gotten right and explain to the class. The less I talked, the more they learned. And I learned that really quickly. Um, we did some role playing. I'd bring in index cards, you know, pink for sodium ions and yellow for potassium ions and hand them all out and have a couple students play the role of the sodium potassium pump. And they would read a script. Okay, I need to pump three sodiums out of a cell and two potassiums in, and three sodiums out and two potassiums in. And within a couple cycles, all the sodiums were on one side of the room and all the potassiums were on the other. And it gave the students a visual image of, of how a cell works. You know, we have lots of sodium outside our cell, a little potassium inside. Um, and it also got them up and moving around in this three hour class, which was, of course, a good thing. There were a lot of open ended challenges. Um, Embraera, the city I was living in, has 7% of the people testing positive for HIV. It's a really high number. So after we did enzymes, I said, well, find some drugs that are used to treat people who have AIDS. And they're mostly enzyme inhibitors. So this really helps them kind of pull things together. I get how this works now. OK, this makes sense why somebody would take this drug to do this. On uh, team-based learning quizzes. And this is the one I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, because I actually have quantitative data, both from my Hopkins students and the Ugandan students, on how these worked. So team-based learning involves giving the same 10-question multiple choice quiz twice. I gave it first individually, and then they did it again as a team. And when they did it as a team, they used these scratch-off cards. I actually brought some with me if anyone wants to see them, um, with five possible answers. And the right answer has a little star underneath. And so the students will work together as a team and say, OK, I think the answer is E. And then they'll scratch it off. And if it's E and they see their star, it's like, yes, they got the right answer. And so at the end of their quiz, it looks something like this. You know, they've gotten partial credit if they didn't get it right the first time. But the goal is for them to leave that session, that class session, really understanding the points I was bringing up in those 10 questions. You know, they've all practiced them together, and everyone on the team is supposed to know the answer so that they could present it to the class. So how do our students do? This is the Hopkins students' data. This is a challenging quiz. The average was about 69%. And then for the group quiz, the average was about a 92%. And you'd expect five people working together should do better than one person working alone. Um, but the question we wanted to ask was, how long does this last? I mean, do they leave the room and only one person knew the answer and they forget? So this required looking at the final exam. And when we did that, we separated out, well, what did they learn with team-based learning? And what had they learned that didn't have any team-based learning? And kind of looked at the two. And they did much better on the exam in material taught with team-based learning than without team-based learning. And we got IRB approval to show up at one of Sri Sarma's class in the spring and say, hey, guys, want to take your biochemistry test again? We want to see how much you guys remembered. And you're going to teach it at the end. And they all said, sure. Actually, I think everybody said yes. Um, scores went down a little, but not really in the team-based learning. They went down a lot in the material that they hadn't done in team-based learning. And our students have said, you know, when I sit and argue with my classmates, I really remember it. You know, it, it helps them to understand what they did long term. And of course, your goal as a teacher is for students to remember long term what it is you want them to learn. Not everyone actually decreased their score. Some students did better on the retest. Than they, had the than they had the first time. I mean, exams are stressful and students are tired, but the students who did better on the retest only did better in the part with team-based learning. They didn't do better in the material that, they had, that we hadn't done with team-based learning. Of course, this made us want to do everything with team-based learning after that. So how did the Ugandan students do with the same quizzes? And um, not so good on the individual quizzes. And Probably because it was in English and that wasn't their first language, but mostly because they'd never taken quizzes before. They'd had a three-hour midterm, three-hour final, all through high school, all through college so far. This was really new, a, a quick quiz where they had to reproduce things quickly. And most of them just didn't finish. You know, it was a brand new idea. Um, for the group quizzes, they did just as well as the Hopkins students. There was no significant difference with that lack of background, with the language issues and everything working together, they could do just as well. And I showed these results to my Ugandan students and they broke out in applause. Because do you know what it means to students in a brand new, small, little, 
BME program in a little town in Uganda to do just as well as Hopkins BME students. They were so proud of themselves, and rightly so, right? They, they did awesome. But of course, we had the same question we'd have with our Hopkins students. How long does this last? I mean, was it just one person that really got it? So we needed to look at the exams. Exam one, which was the midterm, no significant difference. Exam two, there was a slight significant difference. The Hopkins students did better, but I think we should give the Amberera students a little bit of a break on this. One, they had nine exams, and biochemistry happened to be the ninth. Uh, <laughs> the other one, though, and that was probably bigger, the university went on strike. So between my last class and their exam was over a month. And yet they did that well on that exam. So I was really impressed with them because it had been all new material. I asked um, the students, you know, in Uganda, how do you like TDL? You know, because this was brand new for them. They loved it. 95% of them said, yes, please keep both the individual and the group quizzes. This is a little different than the Hopkins students who are like, those group quizzes are great. Mm -hmm. I'd rather drop the individual quizzes, you know. Um, as one student noted, through the many weekly quizzes, I've been able to understand my weaknesses and do better. These Ugandan students had never received these. They had their midterm, they had their final, and they never had a chance to get better. I mean, these are smart, hardworking students. If you let them know, hey, you're not quite getting it, they'll study and they'll, they'll fill in the gaps. So they really um, enjoy team-based learning. 96% of them said they would recommend that other courses do this as well. So they love this. So my teaching in Uganda, I felt like we were able to overcome a lot of what I thought were kind of deficits my first week there just by using collaborative team-based learning, uh, increase their comprehension. I, I was amazed at what the students could learn because their starting point was you know, a lot different and they remembered it. Even a month with a strike, they actually did really well. And the teamwork helped deal with the language issue. And I hadn't thought of how many Hopkins students for whom English was a second language and it made me very aware, you know, when I have them working in teams better, maybe that helps them learn as well. You know, it was something, you know, in my clueless, cluelessness I hadn't given much thought to. So I presented these results to the MUST faculty, the department chair and the dean, and you know, they said, oh, that's, that's great, I'm glad they like them. I also presented them at a biomedical engineering society meeting. And one of the people of the meeting asked me, well, I mean, it's worked really well, but is it sustainable? Like, are these faculty gonna change how they teach? <coughs> um, how often do faculty want to change how they teach? You know, it's, it's hard to get any faculty to do that. And my answer was, I, you know, I don't know. Even if you show something works really well, I don't know if they're going to keep this up at Embraera. So I was thrilled to be asked to join Nest 360 because this looked to me like a way to sustain um, not only curriculum development within the BME program at Embraer University, it actually works for a lot of schools in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this was uh, something I was excited to be a part of. So I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about what Nest 360 is. Um, their goal is to reduce preventable newborn deaths in African hospitals. And the statistics for this are really horrifying. Half of all childhood deaths occur in sub-Saharan Africa. Most mothers my age in Africa have had to deal with the death of a child. And that's just heartbreaking. You know, specific numbers, half of mothers 45 to 49 have experienced the death of a child under five. Two thirds have dealt with a child death of any age. And so Nest 360 is trying to reduce these numbers um, in three ways. And one is providing equipment and training to help newborns, you know, stay alive in those critical moments. Uh, second is follow the data, do a lot of data analysis, see what works and what doesn't work. And the third um, way they're looking at this is the way I'm involved with, and that's to develop education ecosystems. Really teach local people how to solve problems that are unique to Africa. And I'm one of about 15 U.S. faculty who went to a training at Rice University. And the goal is to have more courses with projects, not have 
that 60% final exam and 40% midterm that's so dominant, more collaborative learning, have the students working in teams, and ultimately they would like to see journal articles on curriculum shifts written by African faculty. And I talked to the department chair at Embraer University and said, you know, hey, I've been asked to join S360, would you like to go to one of these teaching workshops? And he was very enthusiastic and actually would <coughs> like to host one at Embraer University. So I think this is a much more sustainable way to try to get African education to change a little than me just saying, hey, here's the results from my one girl class. Uh, so the third part, developing a study abroad course <laughs> to bring uh, Johns Hopkins students to Uganda. Um, I started this pretty much right away when I got to Uganda because I left in the middle of July and I brought students back five and a half months later. So in September, when we had this open house, I needed to have the whole course syllabus and the schedule and everything ready. So I really had to get a lot done while I was in Uganda with that. And this is my first group. There were 10 Johns Hopkins students, all biomedical engineers, even though it was open to any in Whiting, and four Ugandan students. And I had worked with study abroad and said, it is really important to me that I have one Ugandan student on each team, and I think I'm gonna have about four teams, so we need to sponsor them and cover that with the costs. Um, so this is our group. They spent three and a half weeks together. We lived together, ate together, worked together, and they actually had an incredible bond between them. Um, there were a number of course objectives. First of all, seeing what the healthcare needs were in Uganda. Um, using the design process to delineate potential <coughs> solutions to healthcare problems. We had first, second, and third year students with a range of design experience, and we really wanted to get them all up to speed, so we had some design lectures. Develop teamwork skills, you know, with Johns Hopkins and my students. It was important to me to have a Ugandan student on each team, and I asked the Hopkins students before we even left, is this important to you too? And 100% of them said yes. One of the reasons I took this course was to work on a team with a Ugandan student. Some strongly agree with that statement. They had to give oral presentations and written reports. And I also worked with Larry Arenheim and COE to offer a follow-up course um, so that students who had a project that they wanted to continue to work on in the next semester could do that and then present it at the 2020 JQ Business Plan Competition. So we kept the students busy. Uh, we had a diverse group of activities over that three and a half weeks to really immerse them in what the healthcare and engineering challenges are in a low and middle income country. And they went to the School of Public Health and got a lecture on healthcare systems in general. Um, the Ugandans were very generous, and I don't know if post-pandemic this will ever happen again, but they led us right into the operating room many times. The students went to public hospitals, they went to private hospitals, they got to go to rural clinics, got to see patients, talked to a lot of clinicians, um, just incredible opportunities. We went to an orphanage. They don't have orphanages here. Um, there were 125 children at this orphanage, and as soon as we got out of the van, they came running towards us and clung to us because they desperately wanted to be hugged. There were only five or six people minding all these children and we just couldn't hug them. And we all walked around holding children the whole time. I brought them lollipops, you know, as you could see. Our students were awesome. They were just holding these kids all the time. 25% uh, of the children at this orphanage um, are HIV positive. And a lot of them are there because their parents died of AIDS. So AIDS is really a big issue. And it was good, I think, for my students to see just the impact that that high rate of AIDS had on their society. Um, we got to go to a rural farm. I got to be very close with my driver and he brought me to his family's house a few times and I said, would you mind having 14 of us go? And, and he said, sure. Um, for, and, but the, it was the best day for many of the students. This family had to walk a mile to get water, um, had no electricity whatsoever. There were up to 12 kids per family in a lot of my driver's brother's family. So there were just children all over the place. Um, but it was just a really interesting experience. Part of that, they got to see how fruit could be distilled into alcohol. Um, this is bananas that were made into alcohol. There's a really high alcoholism rate in Uganda. It's actually one of the highest in the world. But the good part about being able to make alcohol is that it could be made into hand sanitizer. And so when I brought them into the design studio, they were able to see something positive that came out of that alcohol, which of course was very helpful during, during the pandemic. They also got to go to a uh, completely self-sustainable lodge 
that kept track of all their own water and used solar power, which is what they're watching here, and they had an opportunity to go on a safari, which was actually really kind of cool. So I had the students narrow down all their ideas for projects to one per team or projects. And they got to present this to the dean at Embraer University, a lot of the faculty, a lot of my former students came. Um, and we really had a, a lovely day. And I'll go through these projects with you. One was on more efficient breast cancer diagnosis. And this one was motivated by a visit to an oncology unit in which we saw boxes and boxes of slides that were going to take months and months to go through before these patients would ever get diagnosed, let alone treated for breast cancer. Um, this group um, was motivated when we watched the cesarean section and the doctor handed the baby to the nurse. The nurse brought it over to an incubator and she could not plug the incubator into the wall because the adapter had been stolen. And they were trying to come up with a way to have a universal adapter that couldn't be stolen that could work for all the different donated equipment that Yvonne is dealing with. Uh, this group became very aware of how few imaging systems there are in Uganda. Uh, that one in the far right there actually worked quite well until the computer that controlled it was stolen, which had been three years earlier, and they hadn't had any money to replace that. So they were trying to come up with a phone-based system. You know, the phones were powerful than more computing systems in a lot of these places we went to, and something that could allow images to get taken place. And this fourth group um, really dealt with the fact that everything was on paper and there was no appointment system and you just got to a clinic and you waited and you waited and you waited and then if anything was done to you there was no way of keeping track of it and the next time a doctor was kind of starting all over um, so they tried to get things pushed online an appointment system online to make this a little more automated so I had some post-survey results while everyone wanted to work with the Ugandan student before they came 80% um, strongly agreed that I want to continue my relationship with a Ugandan colleague afterward, and I know most of them are. We have a group chat we do things with a lot of the times. 100% um, felt that it is important to travel to a low or middle income country to personally observe the health and engineering challenges. They did not think they would have the same experience just like watching videos or talking to other people, just really being there smelling that pollution, seeing the lack of water, uh, just really made an impact on the students. Among their comments was that opened my eyes to how low and middle income countries struggle. The lack of technology just kept surprising the students because they had these phones that basically had the computing power needed to send somebody to space, right? But this, these hospitals had nothing. Political corruption and lack of resources are the main problems affecting Ugandan healthcare centers. Even in three and a half weeks, my students became very aware of the corruption that was in Uganda. And it helped to have Ugandan students with them who kept pointing this out, that this is part of the reason a lot of things didn't get done. Very impressed and inspired by the doctors. Um, some of the doctors actually came to lunch with us and sat and talked to our students and were very honest about a lot of the issues they were dealing with. None of these doctors are getting rich. You know, they, they're just really working and devoted to trying to deal with this, what I'm sure for them is a frustrating system in a lot of ways. So we had some continuing collaborations after the course ended. Actually, six of the 10 participated in the Johns Hopkins Business Plan Competition. Uh, one of the teams actually made finals. I learned to tweet in Uganda, and I would post things. Um, the, stu the parents loved to follow me. Um, but this team actually kept working on it for two years on coming up with an automated system. And I also had a team of students who did not go to Uganda who came to me and said, can we do a project with Uganda on uh, maternal health care? So we paired students up from Uganda and with the ones who were, had come to me. They actually ended up working on a project to send text messages to pregnant and postpartum women that basically said, this is what you should be experiencing now. If you're not experiencing this, you need to go get some clinical help. And just kind of a reminder thing. And that project's been actually going for the last two years. I've had a lot of students ask me since then, you know, when you're going back, um, I had originally planned to go every other year. And of course, while I was there in January 2020, the pandemic was raging uh, across the globe. So clearly have not gotten back. They actually have an Ebola outbreak in Uganda right now. I will at some point 
bring students to a low and middle income country. In fact, I talked to Youssef about you know, looking at opportunities to do things. So, so it's really important to our students. I think they got so much out of this course and it just will impact many of them with their careers, um, probably for the rest of their lives. Um, I owe thank yous to home, so many people for, for my years of, of working here. When you work here a long time, you owe a lot of thank yous. Uh, being a staff, like Kathy, <laughs> you know, I could not function as a faculty without her. I think we email seven, eight times a day. A lot of times I've solved every problem. Uh, my colleagues and, and, you know, especially a lot of the women's and the students, and I see some of my students here. Thank you for coming, guys. Uh, just amazing. I've loved working with you all. It's just been such a great experience. The study abroad office was awesome, and if you want more information about these courses from the student perspective, uh, one of them posted a blog, the other put together a really cute YouTube video that's like three minutes long that pulls a lot of these things together. Um, all of the teaching faculty, and I see some of you here, um, thank you, you guys are awesome. I share ideas with you all the time, and my applied biomedical engineering colleagues who are also great with sharing ideas for. And then uh, the Whiting School, CTEI and Mike Reese's group, and then CLDT and Paul Huckett's group. Um, I've really taken advantage of all of those over the years. Um, but most of all, I need to thank my family. Uh, I just have these awesome, awesome children. Not really sure what I did to deserve them. Three out of the four of them came today. Um, one of them surprised me as I was walking out the door. She flew in from Chicago and I was just like in tears with it. Um, but I, I've just been blessed with amazing children. My mother came today, my 87-year-old mother, um, which is <laughs> just so impressive. And I've, uh, I now have all these significant others for my children in my life. I have a great son-in-law, and I have this adorable grandson who's going to be a fireman for Halloween, <laughs> you know. And he has red hair, too, which is, which is really great. Um, my uh, son on the end there, my older son, actually went to Uganda with the Peace Corps five years before I went. He was there for two years and inspired me, um, had a great time and, and lots of lovely experiences. And so I, I thank you, Bruce, for inspiring me like that. And thank you all for listening to me. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have any time. I'm not sure how rushed we are, but I really appreciate you being here today. <laughs> I would love to. It's just a money issue. They would love to come. Ooh. You money? <laughs> you money? All right, we will talk, Pam. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, they would love to come. They keep emailing me about scholarships. I, I have lists of scholarships for them, but um, yes, absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. And they're smart and hardworking and just great. Mm -hmm. Is there any plans for another introduction course? Yes. Um, as soon as things calm down, I've actually talked to Dr. Yahtzee about trying to do something, we might go to Columbia, um, maybe something in the same time zone that has a little more stable political system. I'm actually afraid of going over and having Museveni die um, because I think that would not be good. Um, so yes, there, there are plans and I'm, I'm up for going. I had such an awesome time with the students in those couple weeks and I think they just really learned a lot. Steve. Sorry. I, I have a two part question. Sure. Uh, Part one is uh, you, you mentioned you couldn't give them grades for homework, but did you give them homework anyhow? <laughs> <laughs> I did give them homework, and some of them actually did ask me questions on it because I started each class with that quiz, and it was very similar to homework. So yes. Mm -hmm. Great. And then the second one is um, the technology situation over there. Did the students did they have phones and laptops? Huge range. So my <coughs> freshman class, the biochemistry, which had about 65 students, maybe four or five had laptops. Um, maybe 15, 20 had smartphones. Most had those old flip phones, um, if they had anything. And so they had to pay for a lot of the data and stuff. So it was really... Diana, did you have a question? I just wondered how it is that 
you can have 30 hour days and the rest of the <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, I don't sleep much. I don't know, you know. Uh, um, I like to keep busy. I like to keep busy. Mm -hmm. Well, let's thank Eileen again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a souvenir oh, wow. of, your, of this IPL. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. Thank you. Congratulations. Oh, beautiful. Thanks so much, Ed. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, I welcome you all to join us for a reception in the atrium. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.